My name is uh, Dr. Stephen Woodcock and I'm in the School of Mathematical Sciences at UTS. Now, my job is partly teaching and partly research. I'm going to teach, speak more about, kind of broadly, my research interests. I'm interested in random processes and how a mathematician understands them. Sorry for the slightly corny title, but um, random is a word that a lot of people use and it's a very, very popular word, I think. But I think, certainly from a mathematician's perspective, it's often misused. People describe something as, which is quirky or unusual or just a little bit different as random. And that's not really what a mathematician means as random. So I'm just going to slightly reclaim the word for how, how I would interpret it. So I'll go through some examples of how we would deal with that and why that interests me. So before I can start talking about randomness directly, we need to discuss the idea of a mathematical model. Now, I'm not sure if you will have seen this before in, what you've done in high school, but a mathematical model is just simply some way of taking a problem from the real world that we're interested in and writing down the key properties of it in terms of mathematical language and notation so that I can perform some calculation and know how it'll behave. Now, obvious examples of this, if you look at any building, if you think of a bridge going up or a new building with a lot of very modern designs of buildings going up, which haven't been done before. Now, if we're putting up the design of a building that hasn't been done before, we don't want to sort of build it and think, yeah, it might stay up, it might not, or it might be safe, or maybe not, or maybe if you build an aeroplane, might think, could take off, might have enough fuel to get there, but that isn't good enough. We actually need to be able to say, I understand the stresses and the strains that go through the building and the structure, and I can calculate before I build this building, it's definitely going to stay up. Or if I've got an aeroplane, I can know how many people are on it, how much the luggage is, how much the plane itself weighs, and I can calculate how much fuel it's going to take to get it from where it's taking off to where it's going to land safely. So those things are all mathematical formulas in terms of calculating fuel consumption or calculating strains. So if you'll pardon the uh, slightly hypnotic animation, which I've, uh, like all good lazy academics, stolen shamelessly from Wikipedia, um, of a um, oscillating spring. So it's a spring with a mass on the end, and if I just pulled it down and let it go, it's moving in a particular pattern. If you notice, it's moving with a constant velocity. It's not that it's sometimes going down really quickly and up really quickly, or other times going down slowly. It's keeping this steady down, 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 about once a second. So things like that, of course, are useful when designing or building, for example, a clock. Now, traditionally, clocks were built from either a pendulum, so it would swing backwards and forwards, or a spring where it would bounce. Because those were ways that a mathematician could sit down and the mathematician would say, I know what this spring is like, I know what the mass is. Knowing the mass and knowing the stiffness of the spring means that we could calculate and we could know before we built it that this clock was going to tell the time properly. It's no good building a clock if I think, Every time it reaches the bottom, I'm going to move the second hand on one second. If the thing moves too quickly or moves too slowly, the clock's going to tell the time terribly. Even in a more modern setting, most of you, if you've got a watch or even if you've got a way of telling the time within, say, a mobile phone, probably contains like a little quartz crystal. You've probably heard of a quartz watch or a quartz clock. It's the same idea, but slightly higher tech, where if you apply an electrical current to this crystal, it'll shake, it'll vibrate at a particular speed. And again, before whoever it is who's built your clock has built it, they've sat down, they've said, I know the crystal is this size, I know the current is this, and they've calculated, and they've worked out exactly how that's going to move, and therefore how I can accurately tell the time by basically counting how many times it's moved. So that's kind of why we model things mathematically. Part of it is that we can do the fine-tuning before we've built something. So I say, once you put a building up, it is what it is can't really change it that much. So you want to know before doing it, you want to do the, the trial and error and the perfecting things, a mathematician sitting there with a computer or with a pen and paper getting the calculation right before the builder goes and, goes and builds it. Now, all of those models I've talked about on that slide are not at all random. They're what we could call deterministic models. Now, a random model is one that the outcome isn't known before observing it, whereas a deterministic model is the opposite. 
deterministic model, we call it that because, well, everything about it is determined by accurately measuring where it started. So if, for example, I know the mass, going back a slide, if I know the mass on the end and I know how stiff the spring is, well, the actual mathematical model for that is about 350 year old. I mean, it's Isaac Newton's laws of motion and force being mass times acceleration, Robert Hooke's laws of springs that if I pull a spring twice as hard, it'll extend twice as far. And so 350 year old mathematical model describes that. But the thing is, it is certain where it's going to go. If I know it's at the bottom, I know one second later it'll be at the bottom. I know two seconds later it'll be at the bottom. There's no doubt, there's no uncertainty. Now, most of the maths which you'll have seen so far will be purely deterministic, because if you have a problem that the teacher's set for you, by and large, there is an answer to that. There is one answer. If I asked you to add the numbers five and the number six, very simple, the answer is 11. That is the only answer you can get. Well, it's not the only answer you can get, it's the only answer you can correctly get. There is no doubt that if you answer, what do I get when I add five and six? If you answer correctly, you get the answer 11. That's deterministic, that's certain. Now, if we've got a problem which isn't deterministic, where there is a degree of uncertainty, if I flip a coin twice, how many heads do I get? Well, I can't know that until I've done it. That's a random problem, it's a random system. So if I actually do, just pardon me a second while I reach for my barely deserved wealth, and pick out a coin, so if I did that, then I've got tails first time, I've got tails second time. So out of that time, I did the experiment then, and I got the answer zero. I flipped a coin twice, how many heads did I get? I got the answer zero. I could repeat that and see if I get the same again. I got heads this time, and then heads that time. So the second time I did it, I got the answer two. So even though I did the same mathematical process, how many heads do I get when flipping a coin twice? The answer could have been zero, as first time I did it, could have been two, second time I did it. Well, the answer could be zero, one or two. So even though I don't know the answer, in this case I know what the answer might have been. I could have got head, head, i.e. two heads. I could have got tail, tail, i.e. zero heads. I could have got head, tail or tail, head. So I could have got one, zero, one or two. I couldn't have got seven, for example. I couldn't flip a coin twice and get seven heads. But nonetheless, I didn't know what the answer was, but I knew it had to be one of those three values. So it's random, but I had some idea of what the answer was likely to be. There are other cases where I don't even know what the answer might be. If I want to know, even simply flipping a coin, how many times do I have to flip it before I get a head? Well, I can flip it once, and it comes down head, in which case I only have to do it once. Or I could get tail, and I go again, head second time. But in theory, there's no reason why I have to ever get a head. I could sit there and be really unlucky and go tail, 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 tail. And in theory, I could sit here all day until my, until my finger wears out or until I fall asleep. There's no reason to think there is an upper limit on how many times I can try. So actually, in that case, not only is it random in the sense that we don't know the outcome before we've done it, there's even an infinite number of possible answers. So it's an even bigger problem. So, well, if these things are not known, well, why are we looking at them in the first place? Well, if you think, for example, of an insurance company whereby everybody that owns a car buys an insurance policy to, if they are in a crash, then it'll, it'll pay out to, to replace it or to repair it. But the insurance company is in the problem, is in a difficult situation that it needs to know how much to charge people. Because if it charges far too much, nobody will buy insurance and it won't be worth it. Whereas, if it charges too little, then if it has a lot of claims, it won't have enough money to pay out, or at least it won't be able to make a profit and pay its own staff. So it's got to know how to handle the uncertainty, because there will be an uncertain number of accidents, it's random when accidents happen, and it's random how much they'll cost. There's a big difference in scraping the paint off your car and driving into a tree. So they can look at randomness by looking at some previous factors. Are some car drivers more likely to crash? If somebody's had a crash, two crashes a year, every year they've driven, you'd think that person is probably very likely to crash in future. They're, they're just a bad driver. Or even, this is quite topical I suppose, if you look at homes, 
I mean, there's been bushfires around here lately. If you look at homes, there are some homes which are more likely to flood. If you're in a low-lying house that's by a river, then you're more likely to have flood damage to the house. Whereas if you're in dry bushland, then you're more likely to be at risk of fire. So there are some things we can do to get some idea, even on randomness, that some things are more predictable than others. Now, even stepping aside from companies and their need to understand this thing, every time we make a decision to buy something, if there's more than one option, we have to weigh up what's the chance that I will get a better deal with what I'm spending my money on than if I'd done it somewhere else. So, I mean, you see these new long life life light globes whereby they claim to last twice as long, three times as long, but they cost a lot more. So the decision that you have to make is what is the chance that this light globe will not only last longer, but that it will also offset the extra cost. Because even if it costs twice as much, but it's likely to last 10 times as long, then it's a better purchase. Whereas if it costs 10 times as much, it's only likely to last twice as long, then it's not. So we, we have to deal with these chances because we don't know exactly how each light globe is going to go until we plug it in and turn the lights on and see when it eventually blows up. I'm sure many of your parents will have uh, home loans against properties you live in. And so banks offer both variable rate loans and fixed rate loans. A fixed rate loan is for a given period, for the next five years, you will pay the same interest rate every year. So that's a deterministic system. You can know when you take out the loan for the period the loan is fixed for, you know exactly how much interest you're going to pay each time. A variable rate, you don't because the bank might decide to put it up one month, down the next month, up the next month, and you've got that uncertainty. So one of those systems is deterministic, the fixed rate loan, the variable rate loan is random. Now, you might have some idea of randomness. You might think the economy is going well or it's going badly or there's going to be some change in how desirable house buying is, which might make you think that the rate's going to go in a particular direction, but we don't know. The difference is that whilst I might have a guess and economists might tell me they're experts, I don't actually know what's going to happen. So how do we actually deal with this problem of unknowability as a mathematician? Because it's, it's a bit of a kind of the opposite of what we think of as maths. We think of maths as knowledge and certainty and calculation. So how do we actually deal with this idea of randomness? Now, the easiest case are ones where we can actually calculate it directly. So if we think of an experiment, a random experiment where I pick one person at random and I try to count if that person is a male who is left-handed or not. So I say, out of my one person, one person is male, one person is male and left-handed, if I pick the male left-hander, and zero if they're not. So if I pick anybody who's female as my random selection, that's zero, or if I pick a male who's right-handed, then that would be zero. Like if I picked myself, that would score zero, because I'm male, but I'm right-handed. If I picked, well, Ned Flanders, here is the picture of left-handedness, is male and left-handed. If I picked my own dad, for example, he's male and left-handed. Picked my wife, it would be zero, as right-handed and female. So the point about this is, until I observe, until I know who the person I've picked is, and I find out what and I find out what gender they are and whether they're right-handed or left-handed, I don't know the outcome of this experiment. But I can nonetheless make a few reasonable assumptions and calculate how likely I am to find a male left-handed person. If I say that half the people are male, not a bad assumption in general, unless I've got a really biased sample. I'm asking at a boys' school or a girls' school, that would be biased. But if I've just got a general mixed population, assuming half the people I could pick a male, not a bad assumption, and I'll assume about one person in ten is left-handed. Then, assuming males and females are equally likely to be left-handed, it isn't quite true. There's a tiny, tiny proportion higher of left-handed males than left-handed females, but if we ignore that small difference, then one half of people are male and one tenth of people are left-handed. So one half of the one tenth of people will be male and left-handed. So multiplying two pretty simple fractions, one half of one tenth is one twentieth. So on average, if I pick somebody at random, there's about a one in twenty chance the person is a male who's left-handed. So on average, if I pick twenty people, I'd expect probably one of them to be a male left-handed person. 
So it could be a zero or a one, so I don't know, but I would say I'm about 19 times as likely to get a zero as I am a one for this simple experiment. Now that's a case which is the easiest way to deal with it, and reasonably simple probability will tell me that, but obviously a lot of things, if I'm looking at real models, are a lot more complicated than that. So how on earth do I go about dealing with these? Well, one approach, which you probably won't have seen before in school, is this idea of simulation, this idea of doing the experiment a lot of times. So, if I wanted to know how likely I was to get no heads out of flipping a coin twice, if I didn't know anything about probability, I could nonetheless, I could set this up. I could pick up my coin, I could do it twice, do it another twice, do it another twice, do it another twice, and I can keep going. And if I just basically count a huge number of tests of this and work out what number of them gave me the two heads, then I can have a good estimate of what that probability is. Unfortunately, that's an actually incredibly boring thing to do. It's incredibly tiring to sit there till your finger wears out, and it's also incredibly boring. So it would help if I had sort of my, my minions to do that for me. If somebody was happy to sit there and basically repeat a repetitive task and they don't get too bored and they're happy to keep sort of wasting their own time and their own lives doing this, that would be great. But even then, as a mathematician, it's not really viable to say, I've got this random system, so what do I do? I'm going to employ a huge number of people to do a very boring task a large number of times. It's very expensive to pay people's wages, and quite frankly, everybody would hate their boss for giving them such a boring job. Thankfully, we've got computers nowadays which don't complain if you give it the same task to do a million times or a billion times. Computers just shut up and do it. Um, and so we do at least have another route. And so I'll just go through how very simple computer packages, which you probably have got either access to at school or probably at home as well, how these can do these kind of problems for us. So many computer packages can generate what we call, well, we call them random numbers. They're actually not quite random. That's more of a technicality. It's called pseudo-random numbers sometimes, which picks a number between 0 and 1. So it picks a fraction. So you could get the answer 0.1. You could get the answer 0.4. You could get the answer 0.78496. You could get anything. It's not going to be less than 0. It's not going to be bigger than 1. Now, how does it do that? Or how can I conceptualize what it's doing? Well, if I picture that I've got a dartboard, a normal circular dartboard, assuming I just aim for the board and I'm guaranteed to hit the board, but there's no bias in terms of where it will land. I'm no more likely to hit the top half of the board than I am the bottom, the left half of the board than the right, or the top left versus the bottom right. Every, if I pick two areas on the board and pick equal areas there, I'm equally likely to hit either of those two areas. So there's no real bias in terms of where my dart lands. I can use that to generate a random number between zero and one. So if I have my dartboard there, the orange circle, chuck a dart at it and put an X for where my dart landed. If I pick a starting point, and the easiest starting point is just, if you imagine, 12 o'clock on a clock, straight up, I measure how far round the board, what proportion of the distance round the board the dart landed at. So if I measure that distance there, that's where the dart landed, starting at the top, measuring round to there, and if I measure that circle, then in this case, I was about 17% of the way around the circle. If I think of that as a pie chart, the blue area is, well, 17.3% of that circle. If it had landed squarely at the bottom, then it would have been half the circle, so it would have generated 0.5. If it had, gener if it had landed, say, at 9 o'clock on a clock, that would have been 3 quarters of the way around, so it would have generated 0.75. So if I can just do this, so if you picture my minions with dartboards, basically throwing those things at it, and each time working out the percentage on the pie chart. Now, the point about this is, that's only simulating one thing. That's simulating a number between 0 and 1, which is it's not difficult to do. It's also not very interesting. I wanted to know how coins behave, but also I want to know how stock market prices behave, how mortgage fluctuations behave. So I can actually transform that number into something that's actually useful for me. Because if, for example, I assign a rule to where it landed on the dartboard, I say if it landed on the left-hand side, so if the number's less than a half, I'll call that, I think I've actually written this the wrong way around in terms of my heads and my tails, but nonetheless, if it lands on one side, I'll call it tails. If it lands on the other side, I'll call it heads. So I've got this sort of 50-50 petition of the dartboard. That tells me that both heads and tails are equally likely. So if I've got my minions chucking darts at that, 
half of the time roughly it would land in the blue bit, half the time in the orange bit. So I could get the same result as if I was simulating from flipping a coin. The difference is I can do that very quickly. If it landed there it would be heads for example. So the same approach, exactly the same approach could simulate rolling a die if I've got six sided die, normal one numbered one to six, rather than sitting there and wearing my wrist out rolling this thing. I could set up a dartboard like that into six equal sectors, chuck a dart at it, and I'm equally likely to score one to six. If you look at the little key down the side, if it's in the blue section, that would be a one. If it's in the pink section, it's a four, and so on. I can even simulate drawing a card from a deck of playing cards. There's 13 different types of cards. Ace, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, jack, queen, king. So I set my board up like that and again chuck a dart at it. Now, I don't need to buy a deck of playing cards. I can make a deck of playing cards out of a computer. Bit of an expensive way to do it, given a deck of playing cards might cost you $5 and a computer with this software might cost you $1,000. But nonetheless, it is still a way of making these systems out of, out of a computer. Now, if I want to use Microsoft Excel to flip a coin, most people, I presume, have used Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. Well, I can generate uniform random numbers between 0 and 1 by asking it to set its minions away with the darts, and I can transform those into heads or tails just by saying, is that number less than a half or is that number bigger than a half? So, if I just look at a little video which I've produced here. So, I have to start off by typing, asking for a random number. So, I type in equals rand, it gives me a random number. So, that, that dart landed. 23% of the way around the board. And then I ask it, well, if that number is less than a half, so if it's in the first half of the board, then I'm going to say it landed in the head's half. If not, it landed in the tail's half. So I can do that. And what this is doing now is the computer is basically flipping a coin. Each time I do it, you know, it's regenerating it, it produces a different number, thus a different outcome. About half the times it's heads, about half the times it's tails. But the thing is now, if I want to do it 20 times, Yep, 20 times. I've done 20 coin flips, just like that. It didn't take me 20 times as long to do it. I just copied, pasted the formula, and repeatedly it's doing those. But if I can do 20 like that, why stop at 20? Why not do 1,000? It's just as quick. So I drew... I've done 1,089 there, actually, in the video, but nonetheless. So if I look at estimating the probabilities of getting a head or a tail, it should be about a half, but... I can get that probability by averaging how many times I got ahead divided by how many times I did the trial. So I average the first four runs, I average the first, I think, 50 runs and the first 1,000 runs. Because more and more data gives me a better, better picture of things. So I work these out. So just before the answer sort of comes up, do we expect to have a better estimate? Oh, sorry, I've reset things at the start. Do I expect to have a better estimate of the probability if I've done more runs or less runs. Well, the house always wins in the end. More data means a more accurate picture. So I expect to have more predictability in the larger number of runs. So I'm counting now, if you look at the formula, counting only those which are heads. So that run gave me a very accurate prediction. If I count the first 50 and work those out, or the first 1,000 and work those out. Sorry, I'm just getting the formula right. Sorry, while, wait while my video runs. So I average over 1,000 of these things. Now, all of these answers should be around a half, but you may notice, if I regenerate this, the top value, based on only four things, is really variable. Sometimes it says half, sometimes it says three quarters, sometimes it says 100% of the time I get ahead, or 0% of the time I get ahead. It's all over the shop. 50 is much more predictable. It's 0.4 to 0.6. Whereas doing a thousand, and I was getting pretty much 0.5 every time. Of the thousand runs, 497 were heads. That's really close to 500. That's a really good estimate. So this is really another rule why why you should never use a poker machine. It's set up so that in the long run, it's always going to beat you. So so basically, the true proportion of heads will come out eventually if I do enough repetitions, and that's the key to simulation. If I do it often enough, I'll get the right answer. So if I think of an investment which has got random returns each year, this is the opposite of a um, variable loan. This is an interest rate which is variable. So it's a very artificial example, but if somebody offered me the chance to invest in um, an account, 
whereby at the end of each year, I either get no interest or I get 5% interest or I get 10% interest and all three are equally likely. So on average, one year and three, I don't get any interest. One year and three, I get 5%. One year and three, I'm really lucky and I get 10% interest. Then it's very, very unpredictable as to how much, is that a good deal? Is that a bad deal? Well, it's very difficult to say. If you put a million dollars in it, how much do you expect to have after 25 years? It's not easy to calculate straight away. Well, the best case scenario, sorry, the best case scenario is I get 10% interest every year. If I get 10% interest every year for 25 years, that's a brilliant, that's the best investment you'll ever make. You get, what, 10.8 million after 25 years. It's a bargain. You could, of course, be really unlucky, and you could get zero interest every year, in which case you've still got a million you've not really done very well out of it. Very likely, of course, you're somewhere in the middle. You'll get a few 5%, you'll get a few zeros, a few 10s, and something in the middle. So the question is, what's that worth on average? What's a typical, how much do I expect back? I don't expect a million. I don't expect 10.8 million. I expect something between the two. Well, I can simulate this. So it's a bit harder. So what I've done here is I've set up a, um, a simulation again. Now, you'll see what I've done is if I start the video is I've... The top, the top row, column one, is just a year zero, year one, year two, year three, year four. So I start off at year zero, I put a million dollars into the account. And then I, for each year, I do a random way of drawing what the interest rate's going to be. So basically, I divide my dartboard into thirds, and I set my minions going with a dartboard. And each time, it generates a random number. So the first one, if you look at cell C2, go down from C and across from 2, that landed 73% of the way around, so that was in the last third, so that's the highest interest rate, that's a 10%. The next dart landed only 3% of the way around, that's D2, so it landed in the first third, so I got no interest. So on this realisation, I was really unlucky. I had four years in a row of getting no interest, which is unlucky, really. Um, so this is not a very good one. I've also done this for 25 years and plotted up how much my investment's worth year by year. And you notice the first few years, the line's very, very flat. It's horizontal because I was not getting any interest. And then a few years I got good interest, the line started to peak up. But this is just one realisation. So in this, I put in a million dollars and after 25 years I had about three, three and a half million. But I just start the video. So just demonstrating exactly what I did that I type this in, I set this system up by basically my random dartboards, and I looked at what happened. Now, this is what happens all the time in banks when they try to work out the value of a fixed interest loan. You can see some of these investments, that one's worth, there's a few there that were really good or really bad. You can see I've done it for 25 years. You can see, so just going to go back. Some of these, they vary a lot. If you look at the value, that's three and a half million, the one I was going on. Um... Let me see when I start regenerating. Just, just have a look at the final value. Some of these are up to four and a half million. Some of them are down at two million. It's very random. But if you are running a bank account, you need to know what the average is because you need to know whether or not your fixed rate is going to lose you money or gain you money in the long run. So the thing about this is I can do this and I can regenerate and get one answer, one answer, one answer, one answer. But again, I'm here all day asking, it, asking my minions to go again. The joy of a spreadsheet is... If I copy and paste that, it takes me three lines to get one simulation, but I can copy and paste those three lines down a thousand times, two thousand times, ten thousand times. And as a mathematician, that's great. I've got all of my experiment done an enormous number of times. So I just dragged this down and I basically said, do this, I don't know how many times, uh, where do I stop? I've stopped at just over 4,000, about 4,200. So that's three lines each, so that's about... 4,200 divided by 3 is about 1,400. There's about 1,400 runs. I don't need the graph anymore, so I'll get rid of that. But the thing is, I can now average that. I can say, on average, and if you look at the values of those loans at the end, they vary enormously, because the, the column that says AC, the column I've highlighted, is the average. I mean, you can see in cell 13, one of those was 5 million, one below it was 2 million. That's a big difference. But on average, if I'm running this, I want to know the average. So I can just average those cells. So if I deal with a calculation of the average of those numbers, da, 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 I'll get a good picture. And in the long run, averaging over everything, I should get a good picture of what 
of what what that investment really is worth. So that time it was worth 3.38 million. If I regenerate 3.37, 3.38, 3.35, 3.408. .3 so the thing is, it's really settled down because I've got such a good picture because I've done this 1400 times. I've got so much information. I've got a good idea that really the value of the investment after 25 years is somewhere between 3.3 and 3.4 million. Every time I did this experiment, I got down to the same sort of rough range of answers. And that really is the modern, I suppose, computer intensive way of dealing with random systems. If there's so much and so many things I don't know about it, I could simply ask a computer to do the experiment and imagine the sort of possible outcomes, ask it a million times, ask it a billion times, supercomputers ask it a trillion times, and then just average it. And I've got a really good clear, and it's a very different way of doing maths to what a lot of people have seen where there is an answer. This is about adding up all the millions and millions of possible answers to get an idea of the spread. And so it's just sort of understanding randomness and in many ways as a mathematician deciding to to tame it I suppose, to sort of box it into something which I do understand both where I expect it to be and in terms of how much doubt I have about that. And so I hope that's my attempt at reclaiming the word random for how a mathematician would, would, would use it. And I hope this is just a sort of a nice illustration of just a different use of spreadsheets and computer software to answer. But I think it's quite interesting mathematical problems anyway. So thank you for your attention. Thank you.